Howdy y'all, and welcome to my very impromptu, spur-of-the-moment Halloween special, which I'm basically doing, like, the night before Halloween. It's nothing too big, but I just want to get something out here that's different from just the usual streams, or actually kind of anything I've done on this channel. Now, before I begin, I just want to say that when I was younger, I used to listen to a lot of, um discs on tapes with spooky stories and the like, um, particularly from this CD I got back in the day from this character called the Old Grey Goose, and he had like this a CD back um, like in, in a big glut shelf, right? And I bought it, and it, to be honest, it, it's not very well narrated, it's cheesy, it's hokey, it, it feels very late 90s, if you know what I'm saying, but... It's become a tradition that around every October I listen to it every now and then uh, with me and the rest of the family. But as the years went on, I, I kind of never really like stopped listening to like spooky stories. Um, and especially around middle school time, I found the stuff like the creepy pastas and whatnot. And I, I really actually got into them. I, I still listen to them to this day, despite the kind of negative reputation that they have. Um, in fact, one of the people who's worked on me, uh, worked with me um, with my videos, is actually a former creepy pasta narrator, uh, the Creepy Realms, who has helped me before on videos. And I've appeared once or twice on his channel. Um, whether that be in voice or just um, as a character or whatnot. But you should check him out. But, you know, today I just want to kind of do something like those old stories and creepypastas and just good old The Old Grey Goose kind of stories. And today I'm going to be reading a little old Kenji Eno based creepypasta. In fact, I read this one a few years ago, about nearly three years ago, and uh, it was actually my first time using Audacity, so as the years went on, hopefully I've gotten better, and so on and so forth. Usually video game creepypastas are known for being uh, not so great, but this one really stands above the rest and is a kind of overlooked one, to be honest. So. Without further ado, I present to you The Winds of Regret. Enjoy! Kenji Eno was one of the more interesting men to hit the video game industry, as enthusiasts know. His horror title, D, made a splash in America for getting by on a teen rating, despite dealing rather nonchalantly with cannibalism. The sequel, D2, would have an infamous nigh-tentacle rape cinematic. He once locked himself in a hotel room with composer Michael Nyman until, six hours later, he agreed to compose the soundtrack for his sci-fi survival horror title, Enemy Zero, which failed spectacularly for being incredibly unforgiving. The titular enemy is completely invisible and can only be detected through sound. Needless to say, Eno himself is a man worth researching, Although these days, his occasional endeavors are hardly of interest, but this simple and rather pedestrian story is centered on a different game called Kaze no Regret, which translates to Winds of Regret, a game that fulfills Eno's burgeoning interest in the limiting of the senses in video games. Now, I already mentioned Enemy Zero, but D2 also has sections where the player must navigate the game world based solely on sight or sound. Eno wanted to create a game that could be equally enjoyed by seeing players and blind players, and this somewhat ridiculous concept led to the Japan-only release of Winds of Regret in 1997 for the sake of Saturn, along with Eno giving away 1,000 units to blind players in Tokyo. And for those of you familiar with visual novels, Winds of Regret plays exactly like one, but without the visual part, of course. It's narrated by various voice talents in its entirety and tells the story of young love and loss, which quickly becomes entwined with a suspenseful tale. Eno was known for injecting horror into everything he dealt with, after all. 
For those of you not familiar with the genre, Winds of Regret is like a choose-your-own-adventure game, where events are narrated and then you reach a point where you must make a decision. Once you do, the narrative continues until you reach the next narrative forked road. This builds results in expansive dialogue trees and, ultimately, multiple endings. I'm quite obviously not blind, but I was always interested in Enno's work and the concept of Winds of Regret, and the fact that it was screenlight and actually released hooked me. I think I first found out about it in a blog by a young temp working in Japan, but I can't really remember anymore. After copious personal research and lots of e-haggling, I finally got my hands on a copy of Winds of Regret. Even the packaging is unique and done with evident attention to detail. The box itself is transparent, marked by a soothing blue sky motif, and the instruction booklet is in braille. I also heard that early copies of the game came with a bag of herbal seeds, but mine did not come with such a thing. It all starts as expected. There is, of course, nothing to see on screen, just Japanese text narrated slowly and clearly introducing the game. Then it tells you which button to press to start the game, and so I do. As I actually play through it, the game feels like a somewhat sad experience. Not only because of the complete lack of visuals is disheartening, but because of the concept itself. Winds of Regret begins, story-wise, in middle school. You are initially put in the role of Mizu Sakura, a shy girl who is transferred into a new school and is soon completely smitten with classmate Hiroshi Nanodi. The exceedingly young couple decides to elope, which is a pretty common narrative element in Japanese love stories, and are to meet at the school clock tower at a certain hour of night to escape. Mizu never shows up probably because she suddenly acquired a monicum of common sense. And it is after this point, the story moves away from the character perspectives and places you as an omnipresent god audience, watching the lives of various characters unfold in the city below as years pass by. Mizu and Hiroshi meet once after their failed escape, and then go on with their lives separately, until a mysterious death in the Tokyo subway system makes them run into each other again. The only thing that surprised me about the first 20 minutes or so of Winds of Regret was a single visual that leapt on screen at one point. In between loading for two scenes, a sprite-based rendering of the clock tower where Mizu and Hiroshi were to meet appears. The clock clearly signals 8 o'clock, which is the correct time for the young couple to meet. Later, research confirmed that a version with limited visuals of Winds of Regret was released. But for the Dreamcast... I was playing the original Saturn version, so it was impossible for me to have a mixed up version, but I continued on anyways. As I mentioned earlier, the plot of Winds of Regret quickly takes a turn for the suspenseful, but not the full on horrific. The sequel was planned to be a full fledged horror title, but never saw the light of day due to voice compression issues. I think. Remember, the entire game is voice narrated. Now, spoiling the plot would be rather harmless, but there's no need to do it anyway. Just rest assured that there's something in the subway system killing people, and it's surprisingly related to Mizu and Hiroshi's childhood promise. Now, this is where things get a little weird. Quite simply, after a certain crucible in the plot, images accompanying the narration begin to appear. As I mentioned before, this cannot possibly be the image-enhanced Dreamcast version, so there's no real explanation for them, other than this being a beta version of the aforementioned DC port with placeholder images. Then again, I did get in full packaging. The images themselves are remarkably mundane. They're all low quality, and based on what the people are wearing, were probably taken sometime during the 80s. Most of them are pictures of Japanese everyday life in urban centers. A friend of mine identified a particular picture as having been taken in the Golden Guy District of Tokyo. 
they have pretty much nothing to do with what the game is actually describing. And when the narration gets to a point where Hiroshi explores an abandoned subway tunnel, the game is showing you an image of a young Japanese woman staring straight at the camera and smiling, as if posing for a rather tacky advert. Moving towards the final stretch of the game, the pictures become more, um, intimate. They depict the inside of the tiny apartment bathroom, or the apartment itself, or the view from the balcony. Although, so far none of my Japanese net acquaintances have managed to identify where this picture could have been taken from. And while in previous images, the photographer seemed to have simply taken pictures of what surrounded him, a homeless man in a park, children playing on a swing set, he or she has now moved on to create apparently deliberate set pieces, such as a zoomed-in picture of two English toy blocks, each depicting an English alphabet letter on one side, spelling out, No. Now, one could argue that at this point the pictures also gain some degree of coherence with the narrative, although it is faint. A rather odd element of Western religious imagery creeps into the game, such as a group picture of the young Kogao girls, they're essentially Japanese valley girls, wearing crucifix necklaces. A popular fashion statement in Tokyo, as I'm told. This is congruent with a the theme of salvation present in the layering comparisons with Mizu and Hiroshi to Adam and Eve. There are other faint links which friends have pointed out to me, but there is nothing particularly worth mentioning except for maybe the series of pictures depicted at the end scenes. Consistency in the quality and the general improvised nature of the shots suggests that the same person using the same camera was responsible for them. They are notable in that they no longer take place in the open public spaces or the inside of, presumably, the photographer's apartment. Instead, they begin with a picture of an open sewer manhole leading straight down into darkness. If you're wondering where the game's narration is at this point, it's the final dialogue, which I will not spoil, but it is completely unrelated to anything depicted in the pictures. What is really interesting, as I mentioned, dialogue trees in this game have various branches, paths that the conversations can go down depending on the player's answers, and each path seems to be mapping out a progression of images taken down here in the sewers complex. So, whenever you play this final sequence of dialogue, you're also exploring a different section of the sewers as you progress through the series of photographs. During my first playthrough, I elected what I thought was the standard path of dialogue to go down. You know in games, you are sometimes given a choice, but there's an obvious right answer that the game wants you to pick, and the others are going to lead to a dead end eventually? Well, I picked the right answers. But that's not to say that there aren't other endings, though. So, the conversation progressed, and the photographer's little bout of urban exploration progressed in the pictures as well. I was reminded that Winds of Regret was designed for blind players, and imagined a blind person happily playing for the game, not knowing what was going on on the screen at all. In the very end, the photographer goes down a particular sewer path, with gunk up to his or her knee, as I presume. The camera inches closer to a bulge lying on the side of the canal, until the very last picture reveals what it is. A dead cat. Superimposed on the picture is what looks like a tacky word art rendering of CONGRATULATIONS, with the bizarre additional exclamation point. It's pretty blurry, but then the game ends. Nothing else a note happens. Why would Eno include this on purpose in copies of Winds of Regret? There's no real reason. I haven't come across a single internet testimony or reference to demonstrate that this strange picture path appeared in any other version of the game. The visual friendly port of the Dreamcast does include images, as I mentioned, but they're stills drawn in the anime style and congruent with the game's story, not the odd, low quality pictures in my copy of the game. I picked some other options to see if there was anything else amiss. In order to cement the possibility of this being an early beta version, with some additional content that was later removed. But everything else seems to work fine. So, under the assumption that this was some kind of joke 
by the development staff, I decided to play along and started a second playthrough. Now, have you guys ever played Suda51's Killer7 for the PlayStation 2 or GameCube? Once you finish it, if you choose to begin a second playthrough, it will turn into Killer8 if memory serves, as the opening logo instantly changes. It's a new mode where you can play as an additional character. Well, something similar happens with Winds of Regret. Logo and kanji changes to Kaze no Stigmata. Winds of Stigmata. With Stigmata spelled in the English alphabet characters. Thinking that maybe this is a bonus mode, I began the game. Everything's the same though, including the pictures. Although some of them may have been swapped in terms of order here and there. Or that may be just a repercussion of the different choices I made in this playthrough in comparison to the last one. I was just playing to get to the ending dialogue and see what I would find this time. I picked a different set of answers during the final dialogue, this time going for the Maverick path, the path that the game is tactily pushing you into not taking. There is, of course, an alternate end where events play out differently. But at this point, I had lost interest in the plot of Windsor Regret, and was instead looking intently at the pictures. Once again, the photographer leads us through the sewer system, but this time he or she is going down a different path, which leads further down. The very last picture depicts the ceiling of the sewer canal. It's worth noting that this is the only picture taken with a visible flash. It depicts graffiti painting on the ceiling, of a pair of eyes and a pair of hands. And once again, that's all. My leading theory regarding this picture path and the final sequence of the game is that the development studio decided to include a little extra for one Winds of Regret player, thus creating an alternate story that had nothing to do with the narrative, but told through pictures. Now this is interesting. Even if it defeated Eno's purpose of creating a game that the blind could enjoy equally to those with sight, because it instead created a game that people could enjoy on entirely different levels that are parallel from each other. But the game design theories aside, it seems to be a studio spoof. Now, I haven't done a lot of searching around for this yet, but as far as I know, Winds of Regret has three different endings plus one joke ending that can be attained about halfway through the game. The other three are the results of different choices you make during the final dialogue sequence, the one with the sewer pictures. Knowing this, I started a third playthrough of the game to finish the final path. The logo changed once again into Kaze no Mizu, Winds of Mizu, apparently named after the titular heroine. As with the second playthrough, everything else about the game was unchanged, other than the pictures. However, the final sewer path and its results were probably the most surprising. I picked the third set of dialogue options, which, morally speaking, is a sort of neutral path in between the good and evil paths. Visual novels don't have a whole lot of moral ambiguity most of the time. Once again, I was treated to a pictured tour of what I assumed is Tokyo's expansive sewer system. This time, I was shocked about halfway through the dialogue. The photographer was heading back. The pictures showed him or her retracting their steps back to the ladder leading to the surface world. The final set of pictures shows the photographer climbing up the ladder into the light. And in the very final image, the photographer turns the camera on him or herself and takes a picture of his or her own face looking into the lens. The reason why I have continued to refer to the photographer as gender ambiguous is because, well, we don't actually see the face. The photographer's face is blurred out by pixelation to the point where you can't tell anything about them other than they are presumably a human being. In the background is a nondescript small park, presumably in the middle of an urban center, with some people walking around. I guess it's odd that in the middle of day nobody stopped him or her from illegally sneaking into the sewers. Just like how the tacky congratulations sign is superimposed on the picture of the dead cat in the first end in the first path, this one also has some text, which appears a few seconds after the image just sits there. First, 
An arrow with cutesy pink white kanji appears pointing at the person saying, This is Mizu. Seconds later, white kanji of great size, taking up the whole screen, shows up. It says, Mizu is dead. There are many ways to potentially interpret this, but I feel like at this point I have to spoil the game's story a bit. Mizu, the character, does die if you take this path. So there is some congruency between the pictures and the narrative. But I have no idea what the people behind this whole thing were trying to get say for this sequence. Maybe one of the developer's relatives was named Mizu and died during the development of this game, so he created this weird and complex sequence to honor her? Or maybe it's some collective spoof by the development team. Did they send a worker they didn't like down to the sewers to take pictures saying it was for reference, and then inserted this into a copy of the game without his knowledge? I mean, stranger things have been found in game code, in places where developers never thought tech-savvy losers would look. But this transcends that, because I still can't make sense of it, and because it's so goddamn elaborate. <laughs> Now, th there are a couple things worth mentioning in regards to my copy of Windsor Gret. Out of a feeling of curiosity, I actually looked up the Braille to try to decipher the instruction booklets, and found that the book's text actually translates to nothing but gibberish. The Braille makes no sense at all. Chalk it up to a misprint, I suppose. Furthermore, after I completed my first playthrough of the game, the opening screen logo once again changed. But now it changed back to the original Kaze no Regret, with one difference. It now has a sort of subtitle in white under the logo, which reads, in barely legible print, Mizu is dead. I played through the story a couple more times since then, and the logo has no longer changed. After completing the bizarre third path of the game, Note that I am simply referring to it as the third path because I took it in that order. The paths can be taken in any order, depending on the player. I decided to play it again to try and get the joke ending, which can be triggered about halfway through the story, and thus shouldn't take too long. Now, to my surprise, the joke ending has a page-by-page -page scan of the chapter of a famous boxing manga, Ashita no Jo, while the very last sequence is taken from an old Shintaro Kago one-shot. I suppose whoever was doing this ran out of ideas or time to take pictures of Japanese suburbia. And that's my story regarding my copy of One's Regret. I played around with the game a few more times after that, but nothing else is worth noting. I also have to admit I was a little creeped out by the whole picture sequence because I still haven't found anyone else on the net whose copy of the game did anything remotely similar. So I guess I'll never know the truth. If I ever go back to Tokyo, I guess I'll steer clear from the sewers, just in case. Not that I planned on going down there anyway. Boo! <laughs> gotcha. Well, that was certainly a spooky story to set off a spooky Halloween. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It was a little fun for me doing it, just kind of in a spur of the moment kind of thing. I am still working on a bigger video that will hopefully be out, I want to say, late November, early December? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, it will be on D2. It will be, I want to say, one of the last few parts of the Kenji Eno retrospective thing. So, I hope to see you guys there, and have a happy and fun and safe Halloween. See y'all then.